So we're going to do a tour of the Jurassic Garden here at, um, at Juniper Level Botanic Garden Plant Delights Nursery today. And um, what we're going to be focused on looking at are plants that would have been around uh, basically during the Mesozoic, during the time when um, dinosaurs were walking around. And I think that most people who um, have an idea of what those plants look like are going to be kind of surprised when we actually see the plants that actually were around at that time, and in some cases earlier. Because in your mind, when you think about dinosaurs, now think back to when you're a kid and you get that dinosaur book, you're flipping through the dinosaur book. What do you see with the dinosaurs? Giant ferns, right? And cycads and palm trees, at palm trees, man. But um, in matter of fact, most of the ferns that we have growing around us and growing in the gardens, most of those are no more ancient a lineage than the penstemon plant that's there. Um, most of the cyc actually all the cycads that we have today aren't ancient lineages of cycads. They still have the look of an ancient cycad, but they're very distantly related to the plants that were around when, when dinosaurs were here. But we're going to see that there are a lot of flowering plants in the garden who can trace their fossil history back to the Jurassic period and in some cases we think their um, molecular history, what we know about their DNA pushes them back all the way to mid to late Triassic period. Okay, and some of those are flowering and so we'll get a, well most of those we can see flowering so we'll get a good look at them. So we'll start over here but I really want us to, to sort of take a march up to the, the top garden because there's so many more ancient plants up there. But one um, one that we won't see another member of the genus in, which I, I really want us to, to see, is um, pawpaws. And this is, uh, this is a slender leaf pawpaw, or slim leaf pawpaw, which is a, a simina longifolia. And pawpaws have a really unusual smell. And as we walk around the garden, we're going to look at these really ancient plants. And um, we'll find out that most ancient plants have something unusual about their odor. And that one is the smell, what do you, how would you guys describe that smell? You can crack it a little bit more if you need to get the smell. Spicy tart, yet after shaving. Yeah, okay, yeah, a lot of people <laughs> say it smells like a, a green pepper. Hmm. You know, doesn't it? Yeah. So these oils that are in a lot of ancient uh, lineages of plants are called um, ethereal, they're ethereal oils, but we call them primitive or ancient oils because their chemical composition is unique to what we call the basal angiosperms. And so pawpaw is one of those. It's, it's not the most ancient, but it is one that would have been around certainly by the early Cretaceous period. Um, so yeah, pawpaw is not something you might have thought dinosaurs running around through pawpaw patches, but that's the case. Um, so we'll take a walk on up this way. The, the um, pawpaw is also interesting. You guys seen the real pawpaw fruit, the big fruit on the larger pawpaw? Um, pawpaw fruits, we think, um, were dispersed by elephants. Um, so those great big fruits today have great big seeds. The seeds need to be scarified or they need to have then, you know, some of their seed coat really scraped through to germinate readily. And so uh, a guy named Dan Jansen came up with this idea, but that a lot of these fruits like avocados, pawpaws, that today other animals will eat them like foxes and raccoons will come and they'll, they'll nibble on pawpaws and they'll eat around the seeds, but they don't really consume the seeds and take them away and do what the seed needs to do to germinate. So pawpaws, the thought is, were dispersed by mastodons, which were elephants that were roaming around in the eastern United States back during the Pleistocene. So we'll have a little dead time here because we don't have a whole lot of ancient plants around in this part of it. I think we'll go right out here. I'll wait for everybody to catch up. I know I did a sprint across the garden there for a minute. Um, so when we think about plants that have flowers, um, we call those angiosperms, okay? And angiosperms basically have seeds that are covered with a fruit, okay? Doesn't, we call them flowering plants, but really what they are are fruiting plants, okay? And 
Um, if you think about gymnosperms, gymno means naked seed rather than enveloped seed like angiosperm. A gymnosperm has a seed that's just sitting on top of a scale. So if you think about a pine tree and a pine cone, you have scales and then you have a seed that's naked. It's sitting, it's gymno, it's right there on top of the scale. And so we had to get, because we know gymnosperms are a more ancient group than flowering plants, we had to somehow get from a cone a scale with a, um, a, a fruit to an enveloped fruit that produced something that was attracting pollinators, right? And so a lot of folks uh, were thinking about what would the missing link look like, okay? Well, when we look at this beautiful Nagea that's here, um, this looks like a flowering plant. It's got great big wide leaves. Right? That's what we think of a flowering plant having. This is a gymnosperm. This isn't an angiosperm. It's not a flowering plant. And one of the theories of where these things came from was they came from plants that looked like um, flowering plants, um, but were actually still gymnosperms. And we know now, because we know the molecular heritage of most of these things, that that's not the case. These things just happened to end up looking like flowering plants, but they didn't lead anywhere. They're evolutionary dead ends, essentially. They, yeah, and you can see up here what looks like right. flowers, right? right? But they're not. That's like the, the pine, pine tree. Cones. They're little tiny male cones okay. full of, yeah. of pollen-shedding uh, pollen anthers, but they don't have um, a fruit. They're not a flowering plant yet. Right? So, Nagea and all the things that are related to it, and things like ginkgo, ginkgo is a gymnosperm, looks like a flowering plant oh, in its yeah. leaves, but it's not the group that led to flowering plants. What did lead to flowering plants is actually very, very interesting. Cycads. <laughs> the relative of cycads and flowering plants they share a common ancestor. So from DNA studies now, we, we think the most likely relative of, closest relative to flowering plants look like this, okay? And this, a lot of folks call um, many of the cycas species, the, the cycads that are in the genus cycas, they sort of throw them together and they call them sago palms. They're not palms. They're not flowering plants. They're gymnosperms, just like the pine tree here, okay? But the cycads, and you probably know this if you're plant nerds, this, if you've got a cycad, cycads, they say, oh, it's this ancient group of plants. But no, the modern cycads aren't any more ancient than most flowering plant lineages. The modern cycads, though, however, share an ancestor with flowering plants that looked like a cycad that is more ancient than either, okay? So, um, yes, that look would have been around when uh, dinosaurs were roaming around North Carolina, um, but that actual lineage of plants probably wasn't around, right? Um, however, they're really worth talking about the biology, and we got one that had female cone on it last year over here, so we can look at how they reproduce, which is really interesting. So this cycad, last year, instead of making leaves, it made a giant cone, okay? And it's a female cone that this made because cycad plants are either males or females. And the male cone on this would be a much narrower, much more like a pine cone cone. And the female cone is this massive structure that has seeds along the edges of the scales. So if we, we actually take a scale out, and look at it, you can see it's just like the scale on a pine cone, right? If we packed them close together, and the seeds are right here on the end of, edges of the pine cone looking structure, like right? So it's, tube. yes, it's so weird. And so cycads are kind of like, oh, some of the characteristics are almost animalian. Yes. Because um, cycads have a very bizarre way that they get their pollen or their sperm, in the case of cycads, they get their sperm. To the egg. Um, the male and the female cones produce um, heat and they seem like great places for beetles to come and the male cones produce so much of this really rich, nice, 
fluffy pollen-like stuff <laughs> that the beetles come in and get covered in it and they go to the female cone and transfer over the sperm cells and it has to go when it's wet because this, these cells actually uh, germinate, if you will, and let loose sperm cells that swim by cilia just like animal sperm cells swim to the egg and, and fertilize the egg. So it's almost more like animal uh, sex going on here than plant sex, but indeed that's the way cycads actually reproduce. So um, to get them to reproduce the way we make them, this one didn't get pollinated successfully. We tried, but the male that we had um, shed all that, that uh, pollen earlier than the female was receptive, so it didn't work. So she, she did all that last year, didn't produce any leaves, and the end product was nothing, <laughs> unfortunately. But she'll live another couple hundred years and she'll do it again, right? Yeah. So palms, not a super ancient lineage. They've been around since the Cretaceous, but almost all flowering plants have been around for almost 100 million years. Almost all the major lineages have been around for almost 100 million years. Charles Darwin called it uh, an abominable mystery how flowering plants arose because if you look in the fossil record, there's no flowering plants, no flowering plants, no flowering plants, then all flowering plants seem to appear at the same time. Right? So it was very confusing to him. Well, one of the problems is flowering plants, plants in general, to preserve those fossils, you need good mucky soil and you need a time when you have a lot of water around to do that. So at the time when we actually think flowering plants first appeared in the late Triassic, there was a lot more dry area on Earth than there was wet. And Triassic fossils are rather uncommon anywhere in the world. You find them in South, South Africa, a few in South America, a few in Colorado, but there's not a lot of deposits of Triassic. And the deposits aren't good at preserving really fine detail in most cases, so we don't have really good evidence much farther back than the mid-Jurassic for, for any kind of, of flowering plant. All right, so what does an ancient, ancient plant look like? We got one of the most bizarre right over here. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> And actually, let's see. Let them go by. I'm going to grab a flower off the rhododendron. I'll meet you guys right here. I just want a single flower to compare between an ancient, a primitive lineage, and a more modern lineage. So the plant right here is one you guys probably know. You all plant nerds like me, right? This is anise shrub. Sometimes also they call it star anise. One of the species, Elysium verum, is the source of the spice uh, star anise. And the leaves have, guess what? A very unusual odor. Similar to anise, but not quite. It's one of those ethereal oils, just like the pawpaw that we saw. Okay? So, more advanced flowering plants like a rhododendron generally have a set number of parts. So if we look on the back here we can see five lobes on the calyx, on the sepals. We have how many lobes of the petals? Five, right? One, yeah, two, oh, three, yeah. four, five. Okay, you remember in school we learned di monocot, dicot. Monocot's three, dicot's five. Doesn't really work and there is no such thing as a dicot these days but we still have monocots at least. And that usually they have a set number of stamens and a set number of pistils. So that's an advanced flower. When we look at the Elysium flower, and take a good look at that, it has strap-like things that kind of look like petals, but the very outer ones look like sepals, and the sepally ones on the bottom of that thing kind of whirl, they spiral in, and they become longer and they look like petals and then those long petals spiral in, they start to look like staminodes and the staminodes become stamens and the stamens spiral into um, the stigmas. And so what you actually can see in most of these most primitive flowers like water lilies and Elysium are, um, is actually a recapitulation of the evolution of each part because there were not set numbers in these early um, angiosperms and this angiosperm is uh, really ancient. 
the things that are dicots have two seed leaves like we learned in school. Um, the ones that have two seed leaves and have weird flowers and ethereal oils and all these other things, Today we know they're not really dicots, they're more primitive than either monocots or the rest of what we used to call dicots. And we call these today basal angiosperms because if you think about the family tree, they come out at the base. And this one comes out at the base of the base of the basal angiosperms in a group we call the Anita grade. It's named after the, the orders and families that make it up. Water lilies are part of it. A weird group called Australbaleales, which includes Elysium, the I in the Anita, um, in the Elysiaceae, are in there. Uh, and Trimeniaceae, which is a weird group of Australasian things that you'll never ever see. So these, this is what the most ancient flowers look like. And the most ancient lineage of plants on Earth, the absolute base, is still around on the planet, rocking around out in New Caledonia in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, it's a plant called Amborella, and the flowers look almost exactly like this. The other thing about ancient plants, they tend to have fruits, because remember we had to go from a scale to a fruit. They have fruits that are really much more like, uh, they're all mostly follicles. Uh, Amborella has an acidic carpal, but most of them have follicles. And a follicle is though, if you had a uh, ovule, a seed here, and you had it on a scale, how could you protect it? Well, you could protect it by folding the scale together and fusing it along one margin. That's the most ancient type of fruit called a follicle. And guess what the star fruit, think, have you guys cooked with star fruit? Each one is a little follicle that pops open and has a seed in the middle. It's the most ancient type of fruit. It's a leaf that's been modified or a scale that's been modified into what we call a carpal. And that's amazing to me that we can see that. And this one is so ancient that even though the leaves smell good, I don't know if you sm can still smell the flower, it has a little faint odor there. Um, almost all basal angiosperms are not pollinated by bees. Now, if you're rocking around on the planet 180, 200 million years ago, there are no bees. Hymenoptera wasn't diversified yet. It would be the Cretaceous, middle of Cretaceous period before they diversified, so it didn't do you any good to attract bees. There's no bees, right? But where were there? There were thrips, which is what pollinates Amborella. There, are, there were flies and there were beetles. And to attract those, you smell like dead stuff, <laughs> right? Or poop. So most of these ancient plants smell like manure or they smell like, um, like dead stuff, like carrion. Um, and this one is so ancient, this lineage, that it predates the evolution of mammals. And reptiles probably weren't even that common. So guess what it smells like? A dead fish. Isn't that amazing? Unbelievable. Not too strong. So were all of these flowers really small? No, there were big flowers too. Actually, let's look at a big ancient flower right here. We only have one species left blooming in the garden of this because most of them bloom early in the spring. But here is an ancient flower. So this is Magnolia unanensis, right? So magnolias are basal angiosperms. Wow. We'll step out of the road so you guys aren't getting in the traffic. But what I want you to notice about this flower is that it has sepals that kind of spiral in. And you see how the outer sepal looks like a sepal? This one looks, eh, it's got a little petal-y look to it. This one's like half petal, half sepal, right? And as you move in, the parts are obviously petals, 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 right? And then there in the inside of the Magnolia unanensis is a very ancient looking structure. It has lots of stamens down here and it has the, uh, car the carpels with the pistils sticking out up here. And look, you can even see, you guys have all seen Southern Magnolia. It has a follicle, just like we talked about over here. It's a folded over bract that pops open to release that red arrowed seed. All right, so magnolias, guess what pollinates most of our magnolias? Flies. Flies pollinate some. Magnolia tripetala is, is a, one that attracts flies because it smells like carrion. But most of them have a sweeter smell, and believe it or not, they produce heat in the flower. And that heat and the scent that they produce attracts beetles. And if you look at our big bull bay magnolia, our, our yeah. southern magnolia, 
Those flowers, the first day the, the first day you see them pop open, they're only open that much, right? At night, the first night, they'll open up like this. Beetles come swarming in. And if you open one up when it's like that, you'll see it's full of beetles yeah. on the inside. And then what does it do at night? It closes up and traps them. Yeah. And it traps those beetles in there. And hopefully they've been to other flowers too and picked up some pollen. And the pollen all sheds off the first night and the stigmas become receptive to the pollen that's been carried into the flower with the trapped beetles. And then in the morning, the flower opens up and it opens up wide, right? And it, the stigmas become inactive. And at the end of the day, what happens? All the petals fall off and you're left with what we call an aggregate of follicles I as a fruit. Did, do the beetles croak? No, no, it releases them. It wants them to go away and go to another flower. Oh, it's a one night stand. It's a one night stand. One night stand, absolutely, that's what it is. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. Yeah, and um, we've only recently started to figure out what the chemical cues are to attract the beetles and the fact that almost all magnolia flowers, because they flower early in the spring, they produce heat to keep their beetles nice and cozy during the night. It actually attracts them into the, into the flower.